Okay, recording is started. Let me turn the camera off to make it uh, less, the file. Um, Alright, so today is the lecture number lecture number four, right? Lecture, lecture number four. And uh, yeah, so let's start the new chapter. So the chapter, chapter number chapter number two okay the base the math basics was the chapter one so this is chapter two uh maxwell equations maxwell equations Maxwell equations and uh, I guess the best way uh, to introduce Maxwell equations and discuss them is to basically cover the experimental facts right and uh, basically this is this was the way the Maxwell equations were established okay so the very first uh, experimental fact is uh, that uh, uh, that electric field uh, is a part of our reality and uh, it exists in nature, right? So the electric field. So the first con the first uh, point, the first fact is that electric field field is a part of nature. Is a is a reality. Is a real okay so how we how we define that electric field is a part of reality so we basically take a charge right <clears throat> so there was a very long history on how we observe the charges and how they manifest themselves uh, <clears throat> there are many experiments but this is the fact that uh, if you have a charge, right, Q, we denote it by Q, charge, charge. For example, electron gets negative charge, uh, positron gets positive charge, right? For example, Q minus E. So minus E is for the electron, electron, electron. Uh, and uh, some of you probably remember that this e is equal to 1.6 to the 10 to the power of minus 19 so it's a very very small number uh columns uh column okay uh, so the way we know that the electric field exists is by taking this charge and placing the charge in the electric field and we observe that the electric field uh, uh, changes the position of the charge, right? It's, it's, it can uh, push the charge, it can uh, pull the charge, uh, it can accelerate the charge. <clears throat> so it ch changes the charge position and dynamics, okay? And uh, at this point, uh, we, of course, uh, notice that the field uh, acts as a sort of as a sort of a, uh, as a, sort of a force, right? It uh, at this action it manifests itself through the force acting on the charge, and the ex experiment tells us that this force F it of course can depend on the position in the in the space because. Uh, because the field can be inhomogeneous, right? So it's a function of R, <clears throat> and it's proportional to this value of the charge. So uh, this Q times some function E, which can be the function of the of the space, right? But not the function of this probe charge. Okay. So this E is uh, named uh, electric field 
All right, so this E just introduced that don't depend on the probing charge is electric field. Electric field. Or for, uh, I mean, we will also name this E field. <clears throat> e field. Okay. So, for example, for a point charge, right? For a point charge. Uh, for a point charge, we have Coulomb's law. Another very well known fact Coulomb, Coulomb, law. Coulomb's law, which says that the, the force between two charges is given by uh, the formula like this. So it's proportional to the product of the both charges. And uh, it the force decays as R uh, squared, right? So if the distance is one meter, and then I increase this distance by two, uh, the force drops down by a factor of four. Okay, uh, and uh, if we consider one of these charges to be the probe charge for example q1 is probe probe charge okay then i compare this formula this column law with the uh, the basically definition of the electric field i conclude that the electric field in this case for just one charge if i consider the second one as a probe okay uh, is equal to k q2 over r squared okay pretty pretty simple so let me draw this so i consider q2 as a source and q1 as a probe okay this q2 creates the electric field and uh, since this charge is symmetric if the charge is the point point charge then it's of course symmetric spherically symmetric and it creates spherically symmetric distribution of electric field okay and the distance, this R in this formula is this distance over here. So this, this is R. Uh, and of course, and of course, the second, this second charge, the prob probing charge, of course, also creates electric field. And the actual field distribution in the system will be the sum, the contribution from the both. Okay, so. <clears throat> about uh, about units so electrodynamics usually consider it uh, using either uh, si uh, system of units right or mks system of units um, so <clears throat> And we will be gonna use this uh, uh, SI, which which stands for International System of Units. So, in SI system international or uh, international international system of units. Uh, it is former MKS system, former, former MKS uh, system. Uh, and here MKS stands for meter kilogram second, meter 
kilo gram second second uh, so in this system uh, this coefficient k in the uh, in the columns law this coefficient k is equal to 1 over 4 pi epsilon node okay and this epsilon zero is uh, vacuum vacuum permittivity vacuum permittivity or uh, dielectric constant dielectric constant so it's one of the uh, like fundamental uh, physical constants okay um, <clears throat> likewise I mean some uh, textbooks also use so-called uh, CGS uh, uh, system of units C G S, which stands for centimeter gram second. Okay, centimeter gram second. Uh, in this system of units, k is equal to one. Okay. Uh, there are pros and cons about each of these uh, uh, systems of uh, units. Uh, we're gonna use the the first one, the uh, international system of units, simply because uh, engineers prefer this, this one, uh, SI, and also the uh, numerical simulation software that we will uh, learn also use this uh, SI system. And there are some, I mean, one can find the tables uh, in on internet, how to uh, like rewrite formulas from one system to another system. Uh, a good reference would be uh, I, I believe Jackson, uh, classical electrodynamics. Uh, the book gets an, a good table, like in the in the appendix. Anyway, <clears throat> we're gonna use this SI and uh, not gonna use the CGS centimeter gram second. Even though, like physicists and theoretical physicists, they prefer using this CGS. And one one particular example for that is the lack of epsilon zero in CGS. Okay, so in CGS, no epsilon zero, no vacuum permittivity. That allows uh, fundamental physicists uh, basically get rid of this uh, nasty um, uh, nasty parameter, nasty constant which is vacuum, vacuum permittivity. This vacuum permittivity was introduced at the time when people believed that our space is filled with uh, ethereum, right? This um, medium that support electromagnetic field. Uh, now we like know much more about the uh, vacuum about free space we know that no like uh, ethereum exists uh, but we still have this dielectric constant in uh, the si system of units and uh, in this system of units this is just a constant nothing else uh, but if you don't like talking about vacuum permittivity then you better work in uh, CGS uh, system of units. Of course, the result, all the results are completely the same. Okay, the results are completely the same. 
uh, <clears throat> so in uh, C in this international system of units the dimension of electric field is equal to volt per meter okay volt per meter uh, <clears throat> So likewise, to describe electric field, it turns out that that is not enough to have only L, uh, E field, okay? Uh, especially when we will discuss the presence of matter medium, uh, we will need another vector field named D field or electric uh, displacement field. So this D field in vacuum is equal to the electric field, but this uh, constant epsilon zero, epsilon zero e. Okay, so this is fair for for vacuum. Uh, vacuum in medium it will be modified uh, by the presence of the medium. And uh, yeah, so let also write the name of this. So this is D field or electric displacement field. Displacement field. <clears throat> displacement field or D field, just D field. Okay. Uh, so this is about introduction of electric field. Do you have any questions about this part? So I believe that everything that I'm talking about right now is supposed to be very well known to you. I'm just trying to present this part as a, like in a most structurized uh, and logical um, and sequence right the or sequence the logical way okay so the second point second point will be about magnetic field so existing of magnetic field which is b field we named the previous one as e field is a reality okay so b field is a reality two <laughs> All right, so the existence is existence of magnetic field. So magnetic field is a little bit different to, than electric field comparing to electric field. For example, it uh, doesn't manifest itself by acting on electric charge, okay? Uh, but we can detect magnetic field using moving charges. Right, and here we have this fundamental law, which is called Lorentz law or Lorentz formula. And the Lorentz formula for the force, this letter L here, Lorentz. So the total, the total, uh, the total force uh, that electromagnetic field like any electromagnetic field acts on a point like charge is given by electric field force that the the one that we just discussed and plus another term here uh, which is given by the product of q charge of the of the the charge value of the charge then the velocity vector uh, cross b vector okay so we introduce this b vector and this b vector describes the magnetic field so let us write b is a magnetic or magnetic mag magnetic induction field magnetic induction field Magnetic induction field after Faraday uh, and, and his experiments, we will usually call this just 
B field or magnetic field? B field. Okay, B field. And also in this formula, V vector is the velocity. Velocity of uh, a charge. Charge. Charge velocity. And this formula gets the name of Lorentz. Lorentz force. Lorentz uh, force. Lorentz force. Okay. Um, and okay, um, of course, this formula is written in the vector form and by components. For example, for the x component of this of this formula, I would write something like something like this, right? So f x, this x component of the field. This the first term is just I take the x component of the first term, and second I also uh, have to take this the x component of the second term. So I write q here q is a constant, and then v times b uh, x x component okay and for the vector product for the uh, cross product i remember that the x component is given by the product of y by z and then z by y right and then uh, cycle uh, uh, turning changing from x to y, y to z, z to x, etc. So for the first term I get q e x, then plus q. And for the x component of, uh, of the cross product I get v y, b z minus. And I now I change the, the component so it will be v z b y, okay. And likewise for the for the y component of the of the force it's going to be q e uh, y plus q for the y component the next the next one is z so i write v z okay so then the next one is x again so i get b x and now minus v x b z and finally for the z component Q E Z plus Q uh, Z then next one is X so I write V X B Y because Y is the next one minus minus uh, V Y B X okay so these all three uh, <clears throat> components so likewise to the D field in uh, when we talking about electric field, uh, we for the magnetic field we also need to introduce another uh, vector, uh, which is H field, and it's also connected to the B field simply by mu zero. Okay, so it's a mu zero. It's another constant. It's so a magnetic uh, permeability constant or just magnetic constant mu zero times h okay so this is the h this is the new field so h field is uh, named by i mean just magnetic field magnetic magnetic field uh, so you see sometimes <clears throat> we call B magnetic field, H is also magnetic field, uh, because, I mean, this B field, uh, the actual name is magnetic induction field, but usually we omit this induction and just say uh, magnetic, magnetic field. So from the context, it's usually uh, clear what we uh, talking about all right so <clears throat> next this mu zero is equal to four pi times 10 to the power of minus seven okay and the dimension is uh, newton times 
Newton per meter, Newton per meter. Okay. And finally, and finally the finally the dimension of the B field okay is uh, Tesla is denoted by T Tesla okay you know after the this uh, uh, electric cars and and uh, the dimension of E H field is uh, ampere per meter ampere per meter okay uh, so at this moment let's consider a simple and simple problem so the problem number one uh, so let's consider a charge particle charge particle uh, with some given charge value and given velocity in the given magnetic field okay so what is the what is the force uh, from the field acting on this charge uh, so we need to calculate the <clears throat> calculate the uh, value and the direction of the field okay so uh, charge charge um, the value of this charge is plus two times 10 to the power of minus six coulombs okay the what the velocity of the charge is three i okay i is the unit vector along x direction the meter per second of course for the velocity and the field is also given the field is equal to j uh, t right tesla two tesla and uh, this magnetic field is equal to two tesla which is quite strong magnetic field and points along y direction <clears throat> so what we need to find is basically f so what is the force in this case we have no electric field uh, including the uh, including electric field is rather trivial so let's consider magnetic field so for the magnetic field we have this Lorentz formula which is q times uh, v cross b okay and we can simply substitute for v and b uh, the corresponding values so for the v we get 3i vector times b is 2j vector okay i and j they are orthogonal so their vector product is basically equal to in absolute value is equal to one and uh, uh, direction is orthogonal to i and j so it's a k vector right so uh so three times two is six six times q and here we have i times cross j okay so this is equal to k vector which is unitary vector along z direction okay so the result is 6 q k okay uh, so in this particular case the Lorentz field uh, points to in uh, in the z direction let, let us draw this quickly so this is x this is y this is z uh, <clears throat> so my velocity is long x so it's gonna be this velocity okay um, the magnetic field on y so it's gonna be this magnetic field okay and then there is a right hand rule right when i uh 
like when I point my hands, the, the fingers from what from V to B, the thumb uh, shows the direction of the of the of the result of the vector product. So it's going to be positive Z in this in this direction. So this is the this is the force. This is the force. And the value of this force is six Q. So you substitute for Q two times ten to the two to the minus six, and uh, and get the and, and get the result. Okay. So this is the first problem. Uh, this answer to the first problem. Let's consider another one, which is like more uh, important one, more interesting problem. Problem two. Uh, so let's consider a positive charge Q is equal to plus E, like proton, right? Proton. Uh, in a magnetic field of two Tesla, two T. Okay, the charge uh, is immersed in this field with a velocity orthogonal to the direction of magnetic field okay the velocity of this charge by amplitude is equal to three times 10 to the power of five meters per second okay and uh, the task is to find the trajectory of the of the charge trajectory of the charge okay so it's kind of a very useful um, canonical problem like very important problem for many applications so i even uh frame this problem like this probably some of you already uh, know how to solve this type of problems let's just again re recall what we know for others, it will be useful. <clears throat> right. So again, we have no electric field. Magnetic field is uh, given by the Lorentz formula. Uh, it's Q times uh, velocity cross B. Okay. <clears throat> so this is the Lorentz formula. On the other hand, when I have force okay i can by by knowing force i can calculate the uh the trajectory or the movement of uh of the of the particle using the second newton's law right so the second newton's law dictates that the derivative of the momentum p right over time is equal to this uh force okay uh so the force is the reason for to for the momentum to charge to, to change in time okay so by by components the same can be rewritten this way p dpx over dt is equal to fx dpy over dt is equal to fy okay and finally dpz over dt is equal to f fz okay so this is basically the second newton's law rewritten by by components nothing not, not nothing else Okay, on the other hand, the momentum in non-relativistic mechanics, of course, we say this force uh, is equal to uh, m times v, right? So it's a basic math, basic uh, physics, like uh, elementary physics. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> For example, Px is equal to mvx, okay? 
and uh, vx is just the component of the velocity along the x direction so x component of the velocity so it's dx over over dt right <clears throat> dx over dt so i can plug in now the definition for the momentum to this uh, formulas to the to the second uh, newton's law okay and it gives me what it gives me m d uh, v x over dt equals to for the force i include the i substitute the formula for the the, the lorentz formula right so it's going to be fx which is q times v y b z minus v z b y okay for the second component for the y component i get m d v y over dt equal to q and for y component of the Lorentz force, it's going to be Vz Bx minus Vx Bz. And finally, for the z component, it's equal to Q uh, Vx By minus Vy Bx. Okay. So <clears throat> now I do the uh, I draw the picture, so it's gonna be uh, z y x. Okay. So my <clears throat> so what I know, I know that the velocity of the charge is orthogonal to the vector b. Uh, so I can I can, for example, point the velocity along y direction, so it's v, the velocity, um, like then I can point the magnetic field along z direction, for example, so this is my vector b, okay, and again I use this right hand um, uh, rule to find the direction of the uh, Lorentz force, which is gonna be along x direction. So this is the Lorentz force. Okay. Uh, so so from this picture, I I I noticed that the b y and b x components of magnetic field equal to zero. Okay. So I can I mean this one, this one, and uh, both of these terms. Okay. So let's let's uh, rewrite these formulas specifically for our case, and let's also divide by m all of them. So I'm gonna get d v x over d t equal to q over m v y b i don't put z because we have only one component for the magnetic field okay this is first second is d y v d v y d t is equal to uh minus q over m v x b okay and finally d v z over d t is equal to zero <clears throat> is equal to zero so let's solve the third one first because it's the simplest one so d v z over d t is equal to zero what it means it means that the v z is a constant right because when you take derivative of a constant you get zero so v z <clears throat> is equal to constant so our particle moves in the uh, moves with the velo the z component of velocity 
uh, with the constant z component of the velocity okay uh, and since this is constant it doesn't change in time and we assume that our particle is immersed in this magnetic field uh, orthogonally to the z direction orthogonally to the uh, b vector it means that we can uh, as make the assumption that this vz is uh, equal to zero because no electric field our particle will move in plane so the the velocity is equal to zero uh, velocity in the z component of the velocity of the particle is equal to zero okay on the other hand vz is nothing but dz over dt right so the change of the z component and over time is equal to zero which means that z component or z coordinate is equal to constant okay and uh, since we assume that our particle lies on the um, y direction y axis the z coordinate is also equal to zero okay so we conclude that our particle uh, moves uh, in z zero plane so this is in plane uh, motion in plane motion so the particle moves in the plane orthogonal to the magnetic field okay <clears throat> but this is not the end of the story of course because we have uh, the equations for the y for the x and y uh, components okay uh, <clears throat> so let us rewrite this two equations here again v and then dv y dt minus q of m v x b okay so now i multiply the second one by imaginary unit multiply second one by imaginary unit okay and then sum sum up the two sum up the two questions so what would i get i will get d over dt from v x plus i v y okay is equal to q b over m i can take out from the parentheses so it's going to be q b m here and then in parentheses it will be v y minus i v x okay okay looks uh, looks good so now let's take minus minus i from the second from 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 the second part from here so this minus i from the parentheses uh, vy gets one right and when i divide one by minus i this is the same as minus one over i and if i multiply numerator and denominator by i i will get minus i here and i times i in the denominator gives me minus one so it's gonna be i okay so when i divide one by minus i i get i okay so it is equal to minus i q b m over i mean in parentheses it will be v x uh, plus i v y okay <clears throat> okay so i look closer at this expression and notice that when i take the time derivative of vx plus i vy 
I get the same thing here with some coefficient, right? So it, it behaves as a exponential exponential function with some amplitude and uh, and phase. So let me go ahead and substitute for v x plus i v y uh, the exponential function with amplitude a some arbitrary amplitude will be defined later and uh, and the in the phase right uh, so it's gonna be minus like i omega t some arbitrary omega again to be to be derived so a amplitude amplitude uh, omega is a frequency omega is a frequency <clears throat> <clears throat> All right, so let us take the time derivative of this. <clears throat> what, I, what would I get? I would get minus i omega here, and then amplitude and uh, the function itself. Okay, <clears throat> pretty good. And now I can equal it to minus i q b m v x plus i v y from from this expression. Okay, <clears throat> which is equal to which is equal to the amplitude exponential minus i omega t okay okay so i can cancel this e the a minus i and what I, what i get is the formula for the for the frequency so this frequency is equal to <clears throat> QB over M. So in this formula deserves to be framed. So it also gets a special name. This is known as cy cyclotron frequency. Cyclotron, cyclotron frequency. Cyclotron frequency. Um, <clears throat> cyclotron frequency. And uh, so what we need to get or to obtain now is the amplitude of this, right? So we know this uh, cyclotron frequency is already defined because the mass, the, the charge and magnetic field is all, the, all given. So for the for the for the for the velocity for the velocity I write again vx plus i v y okay the amplitude okay this ex exponential function minus i uh, omega t and now I assume that uh, I might have some initial phase in this in this function phi so phi is just initial phase to define properly the initial initial conditions okay so in this formula vx is the real part of the right hand side so the real part of e to the power of e to the power of minus i omega t plus phi is uh, equal to cosine cosine function of omega t plus phi okay uh, remember this Euler's formula from the first <clears throat> from the first lecture 
Likewise, the imaginary part, imaginary part of the same function is equal to is equal to sine sine omega t plus phi. Okay. <clears throat> so I take the real and imaginary part of of this formula okay the real part of the uh, left hand side is equal to vx okay and the real part of the right hand side is equal to a cosine omega t plus phi uh, for the for the imaginary part i get vy is equal to a sine omega t plus plus phi okay <clears throat> so we know that when time is equal to zero when in the initial moment uh, when particle uh, gets to the magnetic field it's given right here uh, the velocity is over here so the velocity we direct we pointed this velocity in the direction of y so it's a zero y and the, the amplitude of this velocity is given okay so when t is equal to zero uh v is equal to v zero y or y zero y zero right so this zero denotes the initial moment of time it's equal to three times uh, 10 to the power of five uh, five meter per second and uh, vx zero is equal to zero so this is uh, given us okay <clears throat> so for i substitute for the time zero here and here for the vx i get a cosine phi so vx zero is equal to a cosine uh, phi and vy zero is equal to a sine phi okay so now i need to find this phi and a so when time is equal to zero my v x zero is supposed to be equal to zero which happens when uh, phi is equal to pi over two right because when pi over two cosine is equal to zero okay uh, and uh, from here when phi is equal to pi over two sine is equal to one and uh, a then is equal to v y zero which is uh which is uh, three times 10 to the power of five meter per second okay so this way we obtain the initial value of the of the velocity okay uh, so the solution for the x and y components of the of the velocity is given by v0 uh, cosine omega t plus phi phi is equal to pi over 2 uh, omega is given by this uh, cyclotron frequency v0 is given too so everything is 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 known and y0 is given by v0 sine omega t plus phi okay so uh, v0 oh sorry vx is equal to dx over dt right uh, vy is also equal to dy over dt so I can substitute these formulas to the solution for the velocity, integrate it again, and get the final result for the x and y.
coordinates of the particle. So the x coordinate will be some initial coordinate of the particle, uh, x zero, right? So this initial coordinate in our case uh, is equal to zero. Oh, actually x zero and y zero will be zero. Uh, so yeah, so it's gonna be, in our case, it's gonna be r uh, sine uh, omega t plus phi and y is equal to r cosine omega t plus plus phi, right? And uh, this r, after integration is given by v0 over 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 omega v0 over omega right because when you integrate cosine you get sine when you integrate sine you get cosine and uh, and also you get also this omega in the denominator after after integration okay so the trajectory is a circle let's write the the solution so the answer answer is the trajectory trajectory is a circle with uh, r with radius equal to omega or the v0 over omega and uh, the particle uh, like um, <clears throat> spins around magnetic field with uh, frequency q b over m right so this cyclotron cyclotron frequency <clears throat> pretty interesting and important result for example let's consider another problem problem three uh, so we assume that we have a, a <clears throat> so let's actually find let's find magnetic field uh, in the magnetron of a whole microwave oven so magnetic field in uh, the magnetron magnetron of a home microwave oven <clears throat> in the home microwave oven <clears throat> so you might know that microwave uses microwaves microwave oven uses microwaves to heat uh, food right and uh, the frequency of microwave ovens is pretty standardized it's around 2.45 uh, gigahertz gigahertz okay which is and giga is uh, 10 to the power of 9 right so 245 10 to the power of 9 hertz okay so two more than two times more than two billions time the field oscillates per second so it's very very fast oscillations and what happens uh at the level of the food right the food any food contains of consists water and waters water molecules are polar molecules so you get plus and minus and uh, it's a static configuration with static dipole moment and then when the electromagnetic field this microwave field oscillates the molecules of water start oscillate start kind of vibrate uh, around their position and this my vibration this moving uh, hits to uh, leads to the conversion of the electromagnetic field power to the heat okay because the energy dissipates in form of the heat 
And why this 2.45 gigahertz? Because of the resonance of water at this at this frequency or around this frequency. Okay, so at this frequency, the water absorbs uh, electromagnetic energy pretty well. And actually, our uh, Wi-Fi, our cell phones, they also use this frequency of operation quite uh, like frequently or significantly. And uh, since our body, right, it also contains around 70% of water, one might ask, like, is it safe to use microwaves for communications for cell phones, Wi-Fi. And of course, the answer is yes, our body, uh, the water in our bodies, um, our cells, tissues absorb this uh, frequency uh, and uh, get heated up, but just a little because in contrast to microwave oven where the power is uh, uh, tens or hundreds of watts, right? Cell phones, Wi-Fi's, they use milliwatts of power, so this heating is negligible. <clears throat> this heating is negligible. So anyway, so the frequency is equal to 2.45 uh, gigahertz. And this is, by the way, the <clears throat> linear frequency. In contrast to the circular frequency uh, in the formula for the cyclotron for the cyclotron frequency, I remind you that the uh, circular frequency is given by two pi linear frequency. Okay, so we know this. So before that, uh, let me tell you about this magnetron. What is a magnetron? So a magnetron is a, simply a, a, a system with a magnetic field. Okay, so it's a, it's a coil like like this. Okay. Uh, so and this coil is like empty. You, you, the the charges that can exist here, they move around this coil like this. <clears throat> okay, so typically they are, I mean, electrons. Uh, there is a source of electrons. The source injects the free uh, electrons, and uh, the system also gets the uh, static DC magnetic field, DC uh, direct current, right? DC means the frequency is zero. So the static magnetic field. And uh, since we have this static magnetic field, the electrons, they are bound to move around this magnetic field. So it, they, I mean, this moving is circular, okay? And since these electrons, they move uh, like circularly around the magnetic field, uh, they move, mm, I mean, this movement or uh, the frequency of this movement uh, is given by the frequency, uh, basically this formula, the cyclotron frequency. Okay, which is defined by the the product of the charge, magnetic field, and the and the mass of the of the of the charge. <clears throat> okay, so for the cyclotron frequency, we get Q times B over M, right? That means that for for the linear frequency, I need to divide this formula by two pi pi m okay so this is the formula for the frequency but unknown in our case is the the value of magnetic field so 
I get the magnetic field from here is going to be 2 pi m f over <clears throat> over q. Okay. So now I recall that the mass of one electron is around one, uh, 9, 11, 10 to the power of minus 31 kilo, kilohertz, the uh, kilogram. Uh, the charge is uh, charge of the electron minus 1, 6 times uh, 10 to the power of uh, minus 19 coulomb. Um, <clears throat> And uh, yeah, and the frequency is 2.45 10 to the power of 9 gigahertz. Okay, so I can go ahead, substitute this <clears throat> this values and get the value for the magnetic field. So it's going to be 2 times 3.14 for the pi, then 9 times 11 10 to the to minus 31, uh, 31 then times uh, 245 times 10 to the power of 9 okay and divided by the charge 1.6 uh, 10 to the power 10 to the power of uh, minus 19 okay so the answer is around 87.6 uh, 10 to the power of minus 3 tesla okay or 87.6 milli tesla so it's a uh, indeed uh, around the right number so 87 milli tesla so this is actually not that strong magnetic field so the magnetic field is pretty uh pretty weak uh in the magnetron excuse me professor uh, yes uh -huh. i'm sorry to interrupt but um and uh for the denominator uh shouldn't it be negative or do we disregard mm -hmm. the negative sign from the electron yeah because this is the uh, the modulus the absolute value okay we put the modulus here yeah okay sounds good thank you yeah so the answer will be the amplitude of the answer will be the same but for the negative for the positive particles uh, the uh, the magnetic field will, will get minus which means that the direction of the magnetic field will be flipped but we now interested in the amp amplitude of the magnetic field rather than <clears throat> direction okay so yeah so not that strong magnetic field in this in this uh, magnetron okay and uh, and uh, and still it produces quite strong um, microwave <clears throat> microwave uh, radiation that is enough to heat the food drinks etc and of course real real magnetron by the way it also gets uh like i mean the structure like this is like corrugated not, not corrugated but uh it gets a system of whole periodically arranged holes or periodically arranged grooves uh so this this structure uh gets a resonance okay we'll discuss that later it resonates with the radiation from the particles and basically improves or increases the emission from from the system uh, but this leads to enhancement of intensity rather than the frequency or so <clears throat> yeah so this is how our microwave oven works so this brings us to the <clears throat> to the fact number three about electromagnetic fields right uh, and I call this superposition principle. So this is really quick. Uh, superposition position principle. principle. Superposition principle. <clears throat> it it basically tells us that if you have multiple charges, uh, 
in the in the in the in the in the, in the space the total electric and magnetic field that this charge creates simply equal to the algebraic sum of all the uh, contributions from all the charges like uh, the electric field from the charge one electric field from the second charge and uh, maybe some charge number n <clears throat> and the same for the magnetic field the same holds for the magnetic field of course um, <clears throat> so at this point at this point we need to make a note that this is only for linear materials linear <clears throat> materials so so this superposition principle holds true f f in vacuum like up to extremely uh, large charge uh, <clears throat> so in reality it works always works in, in, in vacuum, in free space. In linear materials, uh, I mean, in materials, uh, we assume the material to be linear, which means that, uh, for example, if you have some sort of electrostrictive material, it, it's, um, so this is a sort of material which deforms in the electric field for example you take this piece of material uh signeta signeta electric it's another it's another name for these materials <clears throat> if you apply electric field it gets deformed right it changes the the volume the shape uh like quite often these materials used in in generators because they vibrate when you apply this electric field. Uh, in the same time, it means that if you put one charge in such, inside of such material, uh, you get one field, field strength. When you add another charge, of course, the field will be changed. And uh, un until the number of charges is uh, small, this superposition principle holds, but when you add too much charges, when this, the field is so strong that this material start deform, right? This deformation changes the electric field and uh, hence the superposition principle fails. But for linear systems, for linear materials, uh, this is true. Okay. Uh, another example, of course, for, would be a con condenser, right? The field, electric field <clears throat> condenser, uh, C component in the electric circuits, right? Because the, the one piece of condenser gets plus char charged, the second one is negatively charged, and uh, when the charge is small right uh you can i mean the, the increase in the charge uh um, is governed and uh, the field is governed by the superposition principle but when this charge is too large uh you get a notice noticeable interaction between the between the parts of the condenser one part I mean, they basically start to attract to each other and uh, the system gets become, I mean, it start deforming and this deformation, of course, changes the system itself and the uh, system becomes nonlinear and superposition principle also breaks down in that case. But in linear systems, superposition principle holds. Okay. Uh, and this allows us to come to the next one, to the next uh, fact about electric and magnetic fields. 
and this one is named charge conservation law charge conservation Law. <clears throat> so charge conservation law it's a fundamental 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 law of nature uh, as long as the particles don't uh, uh, turn one to another one uh, when they don't disappear the charge is is there uh, okay um, <clears throat> yeah so charge conservation law the charge the total charge in a isolated system uh, stays unchanged okay so let us consider a system like arbitrary <clears throat> arbitrary system with uh, some charges inside we call them q1 q2 q3 uh, all the way up to some qn for example so the surface of this object is s the area and the volume is v okay <clears throat> and uh, as we already discussed the total charge in the in the system is given by the algebraic sum of all the charges in the system qi this q these charges can be positive can be negative and of course the total charge could be zero uh, if the system consists of equal number of positive and negative charges so the total charge <clears throat> total charge in volume total charge in volume v <clears throat> okay and as we discussed for in these cases when we deal with many uh, charges uh, it's instructive to introduce the charge density function qr charge density function which is given by summation over all charges in the system times the delta function okay <clears throat> times the delta function and uh, as we proved last time if i integrate this um, charge density over the volume of the of the object i will get the the total charge give my system rho dv <clears throat> okay so what happens if i allow some charges escape from this volume all right so this process this moving the charges out or the charge also can get inside this object so it's going to be like moving in a side of this of this volume so let's denote it by this arrow like this and the letter j vector vector because i mean apparently uh, since this is the uh, flux of charges it happens in a particular i mean in a, in some direction and this direction is denoted by the vector vectoral object right so it, it needs to be vector okay and uh, and this j is called current density okay current density so j is uh, current current density density okay. <clears throat> uh, by definition current density defines the current uh, per unit area of the of a, of a surface so that if i integrate this current density over some surface okay like this 
I get the the current uh, the 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 value of the current uh, in this process. Okay, so this is the current that we used to when we describe electric circuits, uh, <clears throat> the grids. I mean, whenever we talk about current, this is the current we usually mean. So this current is given by the integral of the density of the current density over the surface okay so let let's get back to our object with uh, charges in it so our object is enclosed okay and the charges can escape from this object from all around uh, from all around the sur from its surface okay uh, and when charges go out or get in uh, the total charge in the system change and the change of a function is given by the derivative of this quantity over time okay and uh, <clears throat> And uh, when the charge goes out, when the charge goes out, uh, the total charge decreases. Okay, so I put minus for the decreasing of the charge in the system, and then I substitute uh, I substitute this. I mean formula that connects the charge and charge density. To this formula to this expression here so it's gonna be d over dt the integral rho dv okay so the time derivative and the special integral integration can be uh, exchanged so i can insert this derivative in the integration d rho over dt uh, so since the rho is not only a function of coordinate but also the function of time i have to write the partial derivative okay here the partial derivative over time because it's also the, the function also depends on the coordinate uh, the fact that I write the total derivative here over time, because after taking the integral over the volume, the partial coordinates, the partial partial dependence is gone. So the integral is a function of time only. But when I uh, insert the time derivative to the integral, the rho as a function, it, it's a function of coordinates and time. So I, I have to write the partial derivative of time. Partial derivative, okay. It's dv. Okay, so this is basically the change of the total charge, change of the total charge in the, in the system. <clears throat> On the other hand, the introduction of the current density allows us to write the change of the of the charge uh, using the charge density uh, concept okay so it's going to be integral over all the surface of the object okay so this is a closed integral uh, the current okay ds so the integral runs over the surface of the object and now i'm using the gauss integral theorem right gauss theorem to rewrite the surface integral of a field of the current to the volume integral of the divergence of the current okay so this is the i mean using the gauss theorem so these two quantity here supposed to be equal 
this one and this one okay and now i can um write that minus integral d rho dt dv is equal to the integral divergence rho uh, sorry j dv okay so this is so what it means it means that the integrals are equal uh, the integrals run over the same volume that means that the these parts are supposed to be equal uh two which leads us to the conclusion that d rho or dt d rho over dt plus divergent j divergent current is equal to zero is equal to zero okay so this is the mathematical uh representation of the charge conservation law charge conservation law okay do you have any questions about this part okay so let us consider maybe a, a, a quick a quick problem the problem for this part <clears throat> so let's um, let's prove that a steady state current is divergent divergence less okay so prove that a steady state a steady current steady uh, steady steady current is divergence less okay so no <clears throat> no um, charges or um, <clears throat> zero divergence okay all right so we already know this uh we derived this uh charge conservation law here so let us write this again so d rho over dt plus divergence current is equal to zero so this this word steady current or steady state current it means that the current neither current nor uh, charge density is a function on time so i conclude that for our particular for, for this particular case the time derivative of rho is equal to zero so no dependence of current and uh, charge density in in time so it's constant so i conclude that the divergence of the current is also equal to zero okay so the current is divergence less and uh, we can we can imagine for example this type of current which is divergence less right so this is the current without divergence or there could be another type of current like circular current like like this so the current which goes like like circle uh so you can find this second type of the current for example in the superconductors okay when you have a, a coil a small loop like metallic loop made of well, not not metallic uh, the super the loop is, that is made of superconductor okay and then you cool this material down to critical temperature the material becomes superconductor and then you can excite this loop with a magnetic field for example we will discuss the, I mean, the induction this uh, maybe actually next next week and uh, the current will like go around this uh, this loop um, 
and it will be divergence less type of type of current all right so let us discuss the next one the number five it's it's named gauss law and it's going to be the first maxwell equation uh, for today so gauss law gauss law <clears throat> um <clears throat> so let us consider let us consider a charge surrounded by a spherical surface uh, for now we assume that the charge is located in the center in the center of this of the spherical surface the the wall of the charge is q okay and uh, we know from the Colomb's law that the electric field for this single charge is equal to Q over 4 pi epsilon sub zero uh, N vector R squared. Okay, so this N is the normal vector, unitary vector in the direction of the of the field okay um, <clears throat> so let us calculate the flux of this electric field in this in this particular system through the surface s right for this for this surface uh, so it's gonna be the the closed integral because the surface is closed, enclosed, uh, of this electric field ds, okay, over ds. Uh, Q over 4 pi epsilon 0 constant, so I can take it out from the integration. <clears throat> and also the r, r is also uh, constant because the integral runs over the surface and on the surface the distance from the center from the from the from the charge to the to the surface is always r so it's also also constant at the surface so i can take this one over r square also from the from the integral and uh, in the integral here i get one or oh, n vector uh, scalar product with the element of s okay so the element s is the element of the surface on the surf on the surface of the sphere and uh, the direction of it aligns with the direction of n okay so the the that product of n ds is just uh, ds uh so it's gonna be just ds all right uh and the integral runs over the surface of this sphere uh which is equal to uh four pi r squared right so it's gonna be q four pi epsilon zero r squared and this and this and the area of the spherical surface is four pi r squared okay so four pi and uh, r squared cancel down and i and i get q over epsilon epsilon zero all right uh, <clears throat> so for one charge the flux of electric field is equal to q over epsilon epsilon zero for the for the reason we discussed today in the beginning uh, when you let me repeat this point when you move this charge uh, in, within this uh, within this uh, within this area 
the number of uh, electric field lines that go out from the surface stays the same it, it doesn't change and for this reason the flux also doesn't change if you move this charge around this can be proven by direct calculations but i i think this intuition is a i mean it's nice nice to have so when you move this charge around this area the flux stays the same because the charge stays the same and the area stays the same and for this reason if you put more charges to the to the area uh the flux the fluxes of all these charges simply sum up and uh, that means that the flux for the system with a larger number of charges is given by the total charge in the system in 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 enclosed encircled by the surface uh, over epsilon zero okay so this is this is known as the gauss law the gauss law tells us that the total flux through a closed surface is equal to the number of charges in this surface up to epsilon zero which is just constant okay <clears throat> so on the other hand on the other hand by definition by definition flux of electric field is a integral of electric field over the surface okay and now i can use the gauss law to represent this surface integral as a volume integral of divergence of electric field so this is divergence of electric field over dv <clears throat> okay and uh, and we just obtain this formula here so it's the same is equal to the one over epsilon zero q and q the total charge is given by the integral of rho dv right the charge density charge density function okay two integrals equal the integration area also the same so we conclude that the divergence of electric field is equal to rho over epsilon zero okay so this is the uh, first maxwell equation so maxwell equation number nine the number one <clears throat> um so <clears throat> maxwell equation number nine uh, number one um and also uh, in 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 the differential form right so this is the differential form of uh of this maxwell equation uh, differential means that this uh formula works in any in any point in in the system okay but sometimes it we uh when we describe the system as a wall uh we write the integral form of of the same so it's a integral of electric field ds right so the definition of of the flux it's given by the the charge uh, the total charge in the system so this is basically integral form of of the same of the same law okay the integral 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 gauss law okay uh, also from this equation i see that if i multiply both parts by epsilon zero 
I will get epsilon zero divergence E. And since epsilon zero is a constant, I can introduce this constant to the divergence and write divergence epsilon zero E equal to rho, right? And uh, epsilon zero E is equal to D field that we introduced in the beginning, right? So like uh, more, I mean, another way to, to write the same is divergence D equal to rho, which is particular, like, which is the same, but for the, for the vector D. Okay, so divergence of uh, vector D is equal to rho. So let's consider maybe a couple of very quick problems. And, uh, and the rest we will discuss uh, ne next, next week. <clears throat> Right, so quick problems. The problem number one, problem number one about the Gauss law. So let's consider a solid sphere of radius. So solid, solid sphere. Uh, radius R. Uh, the charge is uh, uniform. So the, the solid sphere is charged. And uh, the the charge distribution is uniform, so it's a uh, homogeneous, right? And uh, the goal is to find E inside, inside, and uh, outside of the sphere, inside and outside of the sphere. So drawing the picture, um, <clears throat> the total radius is uh, uh, R, okay? And uh, let's consider one arbitrary surface area inside with the radius R small. Okay, so this is inside. And then, okay, let's let's go step by step. So for the inside, inside, the R, this radius of this uh, auxiliary sphere, is uh, smaller than R capital. Okay, <clears throat> so we can write the uh, the the definition of the flux. It's a the closed integral of e times ds. Okay, so E in this case is constant because the charge distribution is homogeneous. So we can take E out from the integral and the integral just turns into the, sur the spherical surface, right? So it's E to the times 4 pi r squared, okay? Um, <clears throat> On the other hand, uh, since, so now I use this integral formula, right? So this flux of electric field through this surface, through this auxiliary surface, is equal to the total charge in the system divided by epsilon zero. So for the total charge, uh, it's equal to rho, uh, times uh, times v okay because the, v, v, rho times volume because the charge is uh, uh, uniformly distributed within the system okay so uh, rho and the volume of the of the spherical the spherical volume is 4 over 3 pi r cubed okay and uh, from these two, I get the following. So it's going to be E times 4 pi R squared, right? This is the left-hand side. And the right-hand side is uh, given by 4 over 3 pi R cubed 
rho over epsilon zero. Okay, so four pi, four pi cancel, r square r cube I get r, and the result for the field inside the 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 up the spherical object is equal to uh, rho r over three uh, epsilon zero. Okay, yeah, looks good. Okay, so this is inside the outside. This also simple. So for the outside, the charge again is rho times v, but now uh, we need to take into account only the charge that is inside of this green area, right? So this is our new uh, auxiliary surface with a new r small and now this r small is larger than r capital okay because this the area is outside it's going to be rho times 4 over uh, 3 pi r capital cubed okay uh, and the and for the flux of electric field is going to be e times uh, 4 pi r small small squared because this is for the surface uh, yeah and it's equal to it's equal to 4 over 3 pi r capital cubed um, uh, rho and divided by epsilon zero okay so 4 pi 4 pi cancel down and uh, for the electric field outside the sphere we get uh, we get um what we get we get rho r cubed uh, over three epsilon zero r squared something like this okay yeah so this is the field outside of this uh spherically distributed uh charges okay pretty cool so this uh integral form of gauss law allows us to like easily calculate the electric fields outside of some symmetric objects which is which is pretty cool all right, so I guess this is the, I mean, enough for today. Um, the rest about these Maxwell equations we will discuss next time, next week. Uh, yeah, I think it's enough for enough for today. So thanks. I, I let me stop the recording and then we can discuss maybe something.